Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, today. I'm Charles Renner. I'm the chair of the P3 group for Hush Blackwell, and this is another of our monthly discussions that we have been having uh, on the P3 sector uh, during the course of the pandemic and the economic uh, cycle that that has brought us. Um, and as you, um, those of you that have been able to join us in the past may recall, we've had a series of focused discussions, uh, whether it be directly on infrastructure, overall economic impact on the various metropolitan uh, area economies in the country, um, things to the extent of vertical build, amenities and the, and the like, and uh, have continually been working to focus on the outlook uh, for the next 12 to 18 months, kind of on a rolling cycle. And there is uh, a lot of um, good news with respect to uh, the arc of our COVID moment, uh, certainly not out of the woods by any stretch, but uh, being in a better position to, to sense uh, as we start to emerge uh, from, from all of this. And so this discussion that we're having today uh, is a continuation of that. Um, and as you may recall, we've, we've stayed focused as best we can on metropolitan area economies, as well as in the higher ed uh, sector, those areas that have had a high um, sense of facilities and infrastructure and amenities needs going into the pandemic uh, and the types of activities that are likely uh, to stimulate economic growth uh, coming out of it. So we're very excited to have this discussion with you today. Uh, and um, this may be one of the most relevant ones that we could have. Um, frankly, the uh, first out, last in, uh, may be tied to the hospitality leisure uh, sector, and there is so much of uh, many metropolitan area economies that our plan have growth plans uh, based on uh, leisure-based amenities, the hotel sector, and the supporting infrastructure that goes along with that. And so we've got a great panel today to talk about the, the context of that. Um, so we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. I have a couple of housekeeping items I wanted to uh, just touch base on before we uh, introduce our, our speakers. Um, before we begin, I'd like to uh, let you know that at the bottom of your audience console, there are multiple application icons for your use during the program today. And if you have any questions during the webcast, please submit uh, via the question box. Uh, our intention is to have uh, speaker presentations and then be able to address uh, questions as they arise towards the end. Um, a PDF of the presentation is going to be available in the resource folder. And in addition to that, uh, this program has been approved for legal education hours. So to report your hours, click on the CEU icon at the bottom of the screen. Uh, certificate of attendance, including course numbers, will be emailed to you tomorrow, along with a recording of the webcast for watching and sharing. Uh, and toward the end of the program, uh, please be sure to complete our short survey. We use your feedback to plan future programs that are applicable to your business needs. And we do uh, certainly make use of that. Uh, most of our programs have certainly been influenced by the survey feedback we've gotten uh, from previous presentations. Um, that's all the housekeeping items for today, so I'd like to go ahead and get started with the program. Uh, we're excited to be talking today uh, with regards to the hospitality sector, repurposing options uh, in the hotel industry, and the impact of that investment, um, as well as greater infrastructure investments on metropolitan economies. And uh, we've got a great panel. Uh, it's going to include uh, Mr. Paul Brusso, Executive Vice President uh, for North America with Ryder Levitt Bucknell. Uh, Colby Dernan, the CEO and principal with uh, Creed, uh, Mr. Stan Carnes, a director with Nelson Worldwide, and uh, Ray DePrinzio, an executive director and co-head of infrastructure finance with Sumitomo uh, Mitsui Banking Corporation. Um, all of these individuals have had uh, involvement um, in P3-related infrastructure development, finance, and uh, vertical development and all of those discussions. And so we're very excited to have this broad-based panel with you um, today. Uh, I think what um, I would like to do is initially introduce uh, Paul. Uh, Paul, as I mentioned, is the Executive Vice President with uh, Ryder Lovett Bucknell and brings 28 years of experience in program project and construction management, pre-construction project review, cost control, risk management, and litigation support to the team. Uh, Paul's advised numerous clients on over $10 billion worth of construction projects throughout his career, 
and is someone that uh, I consider to be a thought leader in uh, this sector, this discussion, and the overall investment of our economy. So uh, with that, I want to turn it over to Paul. Paul, welcome, and thank you for kicking off our discussion. Thank you, Charles. Much, much appreciated. Yeah, as, as you mentioned, I'd spent uh, over 20 years of my, my career actually in Hawaii managing hospitality projects throughout the islands uh, with a key focus on you know, developing a scope of work, a pro forma based on the client's objectives and delivering those projects on time and budget. I've actually spent the last few years um, in Las Vegas surrounded by one of the world's uh, greatest entertainment and hospitality industries. Um, with the impact of COVID hitting the world and specifically hospitality industry, uh, we've had many of our clients turn to, to RLB and their trusted consultants to look at alternate opportunities um, for their existing properties. Since before 2011, hotel occupancy generally has improved year on year, um, uh, as shown in the graph on, on the screen. Uh, and the first two months of 2020 were no different. As you can see from the, the darker green line, um, in March, with the COVID pandemic escalating, there was a sharp decline, a sharp decline in hotel occupancy. Um, and while hoteliers responded um, to this significant drop in, in hotel occupancy, uh, hotel occupancy has continued to remain below 50% through the summer months, uh, and now in November has dropped to below 40%. While some drive to de destinations have experienced uh, occupancy as high as 70%, like certain areas of Florida, other destinations that depend on air travel, like Hawaii, are closer to 20% occupancy in late November. Similarly, as you can see, the average daily rate um, has increased consistently for the last decade. Uh, however, since again, since March, uh, as shown by the green line, has fallen close to 50%, uh, and the average daily rate is now around $95 and almost 30% uh, when compared to, to this time last year. With these significant drops in both monthly and average daily rates, Total revenue per, per available room is down 70 to 80 percent year over year when compared to 2019, with similar percentage reductions in gross operating profit per, per available room, uh, along with EBITDA. Rec recognizing that all industries have been impacted by COVID, the tourism, the travel tourism, and hospitality industries' delinquency rates have seen historic increases in 2020, with around 20 percent of hotel uh, loans now being delinquent. If you remember back in uh, March and April of 2020, event planners were pushing major shows and conventions to August and September of 2020. And then by Jul June, July of uh, this year, the events were postponed till 2021. Now we're actually seeing that events are either being broken up into smaller regional events or simply pushed until 2022. In the past few months, RLB has been assisting hospitality clients and lending institutions investigate alternate uses uh, for portions or their entire hotel. Some of these alternate uses require minimal capital improvements, while others are assessing uh, repurposing builders that were once very strong hotels. Some of the first con conversions investigated and implemented were the idea of hotels pitching themselves as remote working spaces. Several regional hotels immediately outside of major cities have begun completing minor ff &E modifications to portions of their rooms, which allows the which allows those uh, working from home for the last several months a more conducive environment that is within a few miles of their home. It does not require public transportation to get to them, um, has the amenities of our hotel without the distractions of laundry, kids, dogs, and of course the background TV. These spaces are also used, um, these spaces are only used during the day and achieve the social, social distancing um, from others without feeling confined to your home 24 seven. Several hotel owners uh, have asked RLB to investigate the conversion of portions of their hotels to assisted living. Sorry, I don't know. Go back. With significant municipal needs uh, for affordable housing across the US, investigations and negotiations have commenced between local agencies and developers that have multiple, that have, um, 
uh, conversation conversion of three hotel bays into a two bedroom unit with a middle with the middle bathroom converted to a kitchen and the bedroom converted to the living and dining area creates a 1,000 square foot um, plus or minus two bedroom two bath two bed two bedroom two bathroom unit kitchen power uh, ventilation and waste requirements along with the potential of additional parking trigger the largest capital cost to this conversion outside of outside of the approvals and negotiations with the county authorities having jurisdiction. It's one option that, that people have looked at, um, sorry, the one option that developers have looked at um, and is still being investigated further. Several hotel owners have also asked RLB um, to investigate in uh, conversion of portions of, the, of their hotels into assisted living facilities. Uh, it is not necessary to create a full kitchen for assisted living facilities, um, but they do have the similar ADA uh, conversion costs um, that, that hotel is uh, very familiar with. Hotels that already have large central kitchens and laundry facilities have significantly reduced capital investment in the conversion to assisted living. Uh, again, approvals and negotiations with the appropriate county authorities having jurisdictions are ongoing for such conversions. Similar to the concept of converting three hotel bays into two bedroom units uh, discussed under the affordable housing conversion earlier, rental markets across the US have remained very strong through COVID with high demands in many areas. While sub-metering of individual units can be costly as a capital improvement, utilities are being built into monthly rental rates, uh, rental costs um, to work around those sub-metering costs. Unit laundry facilities are being value engineered um, because of the cost of putting laundry facilities in apartments uh, and, and uh, the developers that we've been working with are looking at central laundry facilities. Again, kitchen power, ventilation, and waste requirements along with uh, additional parking have been the largest costs associated with these conversions. Lastly, and especially within the high end notable hotels, Developers and institutions are, are beginning to investigate the options of residential conversions. Besides the capital improvement costs uh, mentioned in, on the other slides, um, there, along with the residential conversion comes the uh, addressing local zoning and utility approvals, as well as the typical um, residential development issues such as condo, condo docks and insurance, uh, insurance tails. We are still adjusting to a world with COVID, and while we hope uh, well, we hope the light of the tunnel is right around the corner. It is likely that the hospitality, gaming, and entertainment industry um, will continue to see, uh, will continue to be impacted through 2021 into 2022, and probably won't return to the pre-COVID stage until 2023. These are just a few options that our clients are exploring uh, and/or implementing uh, as we continue to watch the hospitality industry recover. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I uh, appreciate that. And our, our next speaker is Colby Dernan. Uh, Colby is the founder and CEO of Commercial Real Estate Development Enterprises, or CREE, founded in 2001 uh, while working with Oak Tree Capital Management, uh, an uh, entity very familiar in the P3 space. And Mr. Dernan and Creed have been involved in the development and redevelopment of more than 100 projects, including all asset classes spanning 15 states and five countries. Uh, so Colby's perspective is broad and deep uh, and understands certainly the intersection between um, all of our metro area economies, uh, infrastructure, P3 investment, and certainly the hospitality sector. And in this uh, difficult moment, as Paul has uh, indicated, it's important to get the insight of those that are um, certainly making investments and looking to the future. So with that, I wanna welcome Colby and uh, Colby ask you to go ahead and uh, take us over uh, for the discussion. Absolutely, well, good morning, everyone. I appreciate your time and thank you for listening to all of us present today. Paul, always good to, to hear your take on things. And uh, I'm gonna take a slightly different uh, slant on it, which I promise will make sense. Um, you know, as I am a full agreement with uh, Paul's statement on where we're seeing the economy go, especially with hospitality uh, with 2020, 2021, and kind of kicking out. And so we act as both developers 
and fee developers and construction managers across the United States, as mentioned. Uh, so my presentation today is less about specifically what to do with your hospitality assets, more about what's going on in the overall economy and focusing on where to focus your money uh, in the near term. And we track about 27 KPIs across the U.S. and so I'm going to talk more about that and you know what sectors and cities we feel are going to come back first. So generally speaking, um, as you all know, macroeconomic conditions in the U.S. between the coronavirus, the elections, uh, China and U.S. trade have created a, a, a much different change in environment than we've had for the last seven years. Um, our overall outlook on commercial real estate is that there's going to be a much greater increase of onshoring of both industrial uh, and infrastructure as well as foreign capital. Uh, so I'm not going to go through and read this all to you. I'll let you go through it later, but happy to answer any questions. Um, and, you know, in a nutshell, for, uh, from, our, from all of our research, our general thought is that we're targeting the Texas Triangle, Austin, San, San Antonio, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, Raleigh, Durham, Charlotte, Nashville, Orlando, Boise, Denver, and Salt Lake as our first target markets for those that are either going to have the least amount of beta or be the first to come back. Uh, generally speaking, as we look, and this might be a slightly different view for some of you, but we actually look at expansion of e-commerce and we look at the expansion of industrial for hospitality. Our overall view is that conferences and conventions are going to be pushed out uh, again to 2023 for a large scale conference and convention. And so we've been targeting where can we look at hospitality assets that are directly tied to logistics, e-commerce, cold storage, uh, and warehousing and, and general growth of business. Uh, this is just a, a good sense to give you an idea of what's going on in general retail and e-commerce and the acceleration since coronavirus took over uh, roughly a year ago. Uh, by the way, it was traditionally flat and we were looking at you know, retail going down on average about 2% per year uh, until the last year, which had about a 400% increase. Uh, again, uh, coronavirus impact, not only on hospitality, but on industrial, and this is a driving factor as you'll see as I get further uh, deeper into this presentation. Uh, just what's going on with supply chain disruption and onshoring. Uh, all right, so your growth dynamics. Uh, for us, uh, once again, we're focused on, on the hospitality side. How do we focus on stable tenants? Where are they? What's going on? As you look at the office markets transition down, uh, we're seeing currently a 25 to 30% dip in office tenants, uh, and we're, frankly, you know, most people, if they're in their offices, have between 30 and max 40% occupancy in offices in the United States right now, and that includes suburban. So we start looking at who is, where are people moving their offices to, where are businesses going, and again, what does that mean in regards to hospitality and more suburban areas and smaller product? Uh, so this will start to give you uh, the insight of where we're seeing inflow and outflow on cities. Uh, and why we're targeting the, uh, the top markets that I mentioned to you, which is Dallas, the Golden Triangle down in the Southeast, Salt Lake and Denver. Um, by the way, not in these slides, but in general, as we start to see where you'll show in growth and outgrowth or inbound and outbound migration of people, the typical city that previously had outbound migration uh, has increased 150 to 200 percent in the last year. So these are where we end up tracking our top 50 uh, MSAs for growth. Uh, again, and this is based off of GDP, housing starts, and in migration. Uh, again, comes back to buy, buy, hold, and sell recommendations on a city by city basis um, using the same 27 KPIs. And uh, you'll start to get a sense of where, where we're looking at and why. Uh, why Austin, you know, and again, it has to do with all, overall population. People have been talking a lot about Salt Lake City, a lot about Boise. But Salt Lake City, if you take it as an example, is 200,000 people. 
the whole city of Utah is 2 million. That's the same size of Orange County where I'm sitting today in Southern California. So as you go through and look at these and look at where you are in the time clock of investment into a city or reinvestment, make sure you're looking at what the population growth is and what they can actually sustain over the next 10 years. So we take a lot of look at uh, the retail clocks. If you guys aren't familiar with this, um, you might uh, want to take, you know, get this from JLL. Uh, or happy to send this around um, through our presenters here and, and share it. Uh, we track this on a quarterly basis. So basically speaking, the upper right is where we're following, and it, you know, typically runs like a clock. So you want to be between the kind of six and nine, or uh, nine and twelve. Similarly, this office clock has changed dramatically in the last year, and uh, now we're seeing anywhere on office in a falling market between 20 and 90 percent. Uh, you know, you can buy office in Houston right now for 85 to 90 cents off on the dollar, but again, you got to, as Paul said, take a look at what is the cost to convert that to multifamily or hospitality. <clears throat> You're also starting to see a very big trend of mega regions. Um, for us, we look at now how the U.S. is really split into 11 mega regions on an economic basis. You'll see the Texas Triangle. You see where Florida is going. So we look at that and go, what is within a four-hour drive market on the hospitality base and on logistics and transportation so that we can circulate people in a concentric circle uh, and really focus on how are we going to look at our hospitality assets without putting people on airplanes. So these are our major markets that we're focused on. Um, and uh, again, it goes back to population growth and business growth. Mentioning economic migration in and out, uh, you'll start to see, you know, red is, of course, leaving, blue is inbound. The interesting thing um, and the latest trends, even on a city by city basis, this can be tracked. Uh, JLL, Marcus has some great research on this. We're starting to see migration out of Denver and into Boulder and surrounding areas. We're seeing mass out migration from San Francisco into Sacramento and people leaving San Francisco and into Portland. So uh, you might look at this on a on a city by city basis, not just a state by state. Um, not going to bore you on all these guys. Just wanted to make sure that everybody could have this for reference uh, and happy to answer questions offline uh, about what we see as I rip through, you know, different regions. Okay, so uh, there's a few more slides I have to present, but again, the net net, as we look at this, as I focus on what is going to be the, the largest concentration of recovery in 2021 and 2022, uh, our opinion are these are the areas, and they have to do with both industrial clustering, quality of life, cost of living, and overall recovery. Uh, you're starting to see some trades in the hospitality market, 30 to 40 cents on the dollar. Um, you know, for me, it's uh, you've got to be down sub 55 to 60 cents on the dollar based on 2019 BOVs, uh, which is not great news for everyone because it means it's getting your equity wiped out. But uh, from our underwriting, we have investors and do a lot of work with private equity funds that are looking for at least a 15 IRR on a 10 year hold. And so we back into it and look at the asset from a perspective of, you know, one to two years negative cash flow, a pip in year three, uh, a soft pip in year eight, and then a sale in year 10. And you've got to get a net, you know, 12 to 13 to the LPs uh, that are behind the fund, 15, 16 to the fund, and, you know, an overall 19 to 20 plus IRR. And so that's where you start backing in as a major, as just a minor investment, uh, all up, all in. So. For us, these are the fastest recovering cities and where we're targeting the United States. And with that, um, happy to uh, go into any details later, but uh, I want to be cognizant of everyone's time and introduce Stan. Thanks, Colby. <clears throat> That's, uh, th thank you. I mean, this this is exactly why we want to be having these discussions to just give all of us a, a chance to tap into the analysis of what is attracting or repelling investment from uh, from all of these markets. I mean, frankly, uh, most of the discussions we have, you can really identify how the, this is all 
uh, driving towards a uh, collection of local economies. And so when you can see where uh, where that attraction is or where it isn't uh, from someone that's uh, that's focused on making investments, it's it's very important for all of us. So we appreciate that. Um, and and once you understand where that investment is coming, uh, what you do with it is equally as important. And so we're very excited to have Stan Carnes uh, uh, pick up the conversation. Uh, Stan, aside from being a trained architect, uh, an active member with ULI and the U.S. Green Building Council, is a director at Nelson Worldwide and collaborates with the firm's hospitality, multifamily, and mixed-use practices, uh, sectors that are all impacted uh, by what we're experiencing now, uh, and directs project design and consultant engineering teams with an emphasis on innovation and responsiveness and efficiency. And uh, those are all uh, key requirements uh, that we were well aware of going into to COVID, uh, needs and priorities, and we expect to see a continuation of that. Um, but as far as uh, understanding what you do with respect to design uh, conversations uh, with what we, we think is a behavioral changing moment, and it's important to get the input from Stan. So Stan, if you wouldn't mind picking up um, the conversation for us and uh, leading us through, uh, through your perspective. Sure, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, uh, we some really good input from Paul and Colby so far. Um, in, a, in a recent kind of national design trends uh, conference in New York that the hospitality industry holds every year, um, it, it, it's, it's, a great, it's a great scene in non-COVID times this year. It's a, it's a seminar like this. And I think among all the leaders uh, of the hospitality brands, uh, there's a similar pattern that we, we've heard from Paul and Colby so far. I'll get a little bit more into what they're thinking about uh, from a design perspective, and a lot of that supports what what you've heard um, so far. Um, and um, Nelson uh, has a hospitality group that's in the mid-Atlantic and the Southeast primarily, and the Midwest. And <clears throat> there, we're just I'm sort of using these four projects that are in development now, uh, under construction and just getting ready to open right in the midst of COVID. And they're all, all those owners, that the, the local developers plus the, plus the franchises are challenged with, with what to do in the near term. And, uh, uh, and also we'll talk a little bit about the long term. Um, uh, so there's, there, we, we think of it in terms of uh, uh, the market sectors as well. And, and you've heard from Paul a little bit uh, the difference between in the hospitality industry between the drivable and leisure components versus the air travel and the business conference and the resorts and all of those different businesses within hospitality are experiencing COVID in different ways. Um, generally, the drivable ones, the within 250 mile range, has been relatively stable. Um, some of the resort properties are reasonably s stable particularly the eco resorts this summer, a lot of those that focus on outdoor experiences and, and that have, have been doing reasonably well. The, the air travel uh, leisure, particularly the luxury brands are really struggling. And certainly those that have big investments in business, um, a conference and conventions are, are gonna, gonna have a long recovery. So, all, you know, it's good, it's interesting, it's important to note that within hospitality, there's those different experiences. Um, um, and we also look at the property status. Uh, like I said, there's existing properties that uh, have to deal with it. Um, there, what, what can those property owners do um, in the near term? Uh, there are properties under planning, properties under construction, and, and you know, again, beginning to think about what, what's going to happen in the long term in the future. For existing properties, there's a, a lot of um, discussion with what we can do internally. Um, for example, the, uh, changing the guest rooms, and you heard about this a little bit from Paul, similar experience here. What can we do with the guest rooms? And um, if you're converting the guest room to day use, as, 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 as Paul mentioned, that's one. Uh, there's tweaking the guest rooms to uh, uh, allow in-room fitness, things that people can do in their rooms to minimize contact with the general public. 
And there's it seemed to be some growth with adding Peloton stations, for example, in guest rooms rather than the old chair and conference table. There's um, uh, um, yeah workspaces for the day. Um, the properties are focused on guest and employee safety. What can you do now to uh, um, minimize um, uh, COVID-related transfers in, in the properties? A lot of interest in automation. What can we do with touchless tech, whether it's uh, the, how you get into your room, uh, of course, handless uh, faucets and the like, um, cleaning protocols and the marketing of cleaning protocols so guests know what's going on in terms of cleaning and protocols. Um, and then there's the public spaces like the, the, the lounge, the bar, conference room, if you have a conference room. Clearly, uh, if properties have outdoor space, they immediately take advantage of that, at least recently, until the, you know, the more severe shutdowns have happened. Um, there's community outreach. Um, if you have an F&B component, those restaurants uh, can uh, have community outreach, and many of them are trying to connect with DoorDash and serve the community with their with their kitchen and try and keep at least part of their kitchen staff on on board. Um, a lot of the properties are pretty are pretty quiet. There's there's some that survive with with the air crews that still are traveling around, but um, generally pretty quiet. Um, let me get my mouse back onto the slide change here trying to advance the slide um, there we go okay did it advance yet no there it's going going slow um, so properties under planning uh, they're if you're you're planning a project, you're working with a franchise, and the, and a lot of the brands are trying to tweak their franchises, um, and you still have a chance to now integrate some mechanical requirements uh, enhancements. Uh, we just opened a, a property just opened this week that um, included a bipolar ionization in the in mechanical units. It's something that you can retrofit into a pre-designed system. And there are also considerations for underflow air supply, things that you, you might be able to plan in to increase long-term the effectiveness of the mechanical system uh, to you know, avoid any um, kind of COVID-related problems. Um, there's um, site plan, there's minimal site plan impacts, but again, if you're planning, obviously there's more interest in active outdoor areas that you can use in case this happens again in the future, restaurants, seating outside, uh, uh, fitness activities outside. So in, in some cases where you see site planning with very minimal outdoor public use other than parking, there's now interest in making sure that there's some areas that you can span out to if you need to in the future. Um, there's uh, properties under construction, again, the same thing. You, um, there's tweaking going on with the mechanical. There's, um, uh, again, reviewing the uh, surfaces and finishes. And um, uh, uh, they're opening, the one we're opening, it's opening with limited occupancy in the short term, maybe 25%, so that you have fewer guests per floor, fewer guests in the elevators. And they'll ride that through at least in the near term until maybe midsummer or so and they can ramp back up. Um, uh, and in the future, um, just before we get to Ray, um, there's what we're seeing is a lot of, uh, of, of densification, meaning interest in putting uh, hotel properties near other uses like multifamily, malls. Uh, Nelson is seeing a lot of uh, rethinking of older existing malls uh, where they're trying to get 24 seven communities now at those malls and that includes hospitality and multifamily. And uh, those projects, we, we've got a number of those on the boards, um, invariably get to uh, shared parking and, and infrastructure requirements that will we'll come up later with, with respect to future and with the infrastructure. 
So that's what we're seeing generally in the, in the hospitality industry. Thanks, Dan. Uh, very much appreciate that, that input. And um, there's a greater context to this entire discussion. And l largely it has to do with um, the, the placemaking components and the strength of all of the metropolitan area economies that we uh, touch and work in. Uh, and so there's a natural overlap uh, between all of the vertical design that uh, has been discussed, uh, the metropolitan uh, area of finance and economies, and the infrastructure to support it. Um, and we kind of tend to look at all of that woven together in the P3 space. And one of the key folks we always enjoy speaking with in that context is Ray DiPrenzio. Uh, he's the executive director and co-head of infrastructure finance at Sumitomo Mitsui Banking Corporation and currently leads a team of project finance bankers providing advisory, banking, and financial support for uh, private developers, construction companies, and equity investors in the very markets that we're discussing. Uh, and has always got a very insightful perspective on a macro level. So uh, we're very excited to have Ray participate in our discussion. And uh, Ray, we'd like to turn it over to you and uh, hear your thoughts. And we may have lost Ray for a moment. So I think what I'm gonna do uh, while, we're, uh, while we're looking to have him uh, rejoin us is uh, I'd like to go back to um, Colby and Paul. Uh, Sorry, Charles. With, oh, there you are, Ray. you go right ahead. Sorry, Charles, I think I was doing a, um, a very good job of keeping my mute button on um, as, uh, as we all should when we're not speaking. So I apologize for that. Yeah, it's all right. So the as I say, the moment is, uh, can you hear me now so we can hear you? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so again, Charles, thank you for that very kind introduction. We really appreciate um, being invited to participate um, in this panel um, and your interest in SNBC and our, our infrastructure practice. Um, Charles, I think as you rightly set it up, and it, it, I appreciate coming at the end of um, the presentations that, that have preceded me, um, public-private partnerships are a tool um, that have provided a number of different sectors of the economy support um, you know, in a way that is not necessarily um, typical or obvious, particularly with respect to the hospitality industry and, um, and the situation that we're finding us in right now. Maybe a couple of just key points on SNBC in case anybody out there doesn't know who exactly we are. Sumitomo Mitsui is one of the three mega banks um, that are headquartered in Japan. Um, we're a very global institution. We are hundreds of years old and have been operating in the United States um, as of last year for lit literally 100 years. Um, so we have quite a history in the U.S., obviously led by our um, Japanese clients, but our platform has grown considerably. And where the P3 business lies is within our overall global structured finance practice, which is um, what we effectively call project finance. And project finance has um, historically been um, rooted in the in energy industry, but has expanded considerably beyond that into natural resources. And then in the last 10 years, at least that we've been participating in it, um, more formally in what we refer to as infrastructure, which is really non-energy um, project finance. So areas such as transportation, um, social infrastructure, which is where I think we are, we're gonna spend some time talking today, um, environmental facilities, um, water, waste related, um, as well as digital infrastructure, which is an important and very fast growing sector for SNBC and for the larger, larger market as a whole. Um, we are, in, in fact, the largest provider of financing um, through our balance sheet in North America to P3s um, since about 2017. So it's a business that um, I helped start uh, back in uh, during the last crisis in 2008, um, when the bank really expanded its footprint. And um, we have taken an approach that has evolved from um, being primarily a, a very large and very capable um, balance sheet lender to really having four legs of a stool, which includes, um, as Charles mentioned, an advisory practice, but also a debt capital markets practice, um, as well as a derivatives practice that effectively provides clients on the developer side primarily, 
um, with support across the financing. So we're kind of a one-stop shop, if you, if I may uh, use that phrase. Um, P3s in the United States have been around for quite some time. Um, we're by no means the largest uh, market for the use of it. Canada, just to the north of us, um, is really world class in, in utilizing P3s across a number of different sectors. Transport was really where we all started. Um, but social infrastructure very quickly came to the forefront. And in markets such as Canada, it includes um, healthcare, hospital facilities, as well as higher ed. Um, and in the United States, since we have a, a number of different tools to finance healthcare, um, P3s have not focused primarily on that, but have really um, looked so in the social infrastructure sector at downtown related real estate assets that are in one way, one way shape or form public use, um, or at least partly public use. And courthouses were probably one of the first uses of P3s for um, social infrastructure. We had a, um, a, a very well-known financing for the Long Beach Courthouse in, in California, which was originally um, a bank financing. And I'll touch on the different markets in a moment, but uh, eventually was refinanced out into the capital markets. But when we talk about social infrastructure, as I'm saying, it, it is um, a catch-all phrase used to incorporate real property assets or real assets that um, are in pub public use in one way, shape, or form. So it might be um, a, a courthouse, it might be a city hall, it might be a civic center. Long Beach, um, the city of Long Beach in California, for instance, redeveloped its entire um, city hall complex um, into a civic center. And we were um, one of the largest lenders to that project, along with the developer, um, a very key client of ours, Plenary Development. Um, so that was a that was a great success. And what I want to point point out here is that while hospitality assets are not a typical use of P3, in the context of, of post COVID, um, as we look to the future, um, there are certainly applications of which um, we should begin thinking about where, um, in partnership with government, and and that's truly what a P3 is is at is about at its core. Um, we can look at the capital structure of a P3 and, in effect, start to chop up different revenue streams. What I mean by that is we typically see P3s as a relatively conservative debt structure, meaning that the revenue stream that's supporting the debt financing, and these are typically highly levered financings. The, uh, the P3 market is not unfamiliar with um, a 90-10 debt structure where we'll see 10% equity and 90% debt. And the reason that that's, a, that's actually the case is that we have in greenfield situations relatively strong um, construction security packages, well-known contractors with um, a, a fairly robust um, architecture around liquidity and, and ultimately completion support. But at the same time, um, a revenue structure that is often tied directly back to um, a governmental entity. Um, an availability payment is a phrase you'll hear often in, in the P3 world, and an availability payment is simply that. It, it's, it's the government essentially making a payment that is made based on a contractual um, provision that essentially says to the project co, the developer and its partners, um, that they will make available um, that asset in, in accordance with the contract term. So these could be um, metrics or KPIs, if you will, around um, the operation of the building, the maintenance of the building, and the like. But typically not um, dealing at all with the core performance of the facility, meaning we separate out, in effect, the real estate and the infrastructure more broadly from the core performance of the entity. And that's where I think we can really begin to think about how a P3 can be utilized in the hospitality sector. Generally speaking, most folks in, in my world would look at hospitality and say, oh, oh, that's not really a use of P3, way too high risk. And I think what we really need to be thinking about is dividing up the revenue stream, where in effect, part of the revenue stream can be coming from an availability payment, which supports the overall infrastructure and has a certain class of investors that are familiar with P3s, whereas more riskier or higher risk forms of revenue that might be tied to occupancy, variable forms of revenue, or parking, as an, in, as a, as an example, um, might be chopped off in a capital stack and 
um, sold in effect or, or invested in by a different class of debt investors. And by looking at, at P3s in this context, um, we, be, we can begin to utilize the architecture of a, of a public private partnership um, and at the same time bring in investors that are looking for um, the, the returns and the yields um, that we were referring to earlier, those, those mid-teens to high-teens related returns, which are typically not found in infrastructure. If you look at the overall market for P3s and for infrastructure assets overall, as the market has become much more um, well understood and, and frankly more familiar in general, um, the return characteristics of core infrastructure, and, and downtown hospitality is certainly not core infrastructure, but core infrastructure from a portfolio management perspective has come down significantly where the equity IRRs are well into the si single digits, particularly on larger scale regional regional wide transportation assets. So um, keep that context in mind from an equity perspective, but on the debt side, we have also very, very competitive debt terms. COVID certainly had an impact, um, if I can touch on this just for a minute, um, to the P3 sector, particularly around hospitality and transportation. Um, airlines obviously going through um, the difficulties that they are have clearly affected particularly greenfield development in the airport sector and in the larger hospitality sector as a whole. So we're really sitting right now um, in a state where we're looking at 2019 and the, the, um, the great minds that are at work on this are trying to identify when do we get back to 2019, if at all, and what does that pro forma really look like? And that, that time frame, as you might imagine, has been pushed out longer and longer. So we're probably looking right now somewhere in the 2024 timeframe before we truly recover, particularly in the transportation and the hospitality sector. In terms of markets, just to touch on this for a second, and apologize um, that I didn't get to this earlier. Um, P3s have enjoyed acceptance across a number of debt markets. So equity investors are um, welcome in both the bank market, which, which has um, obviously been very, very accommodating in terms of understanding construction, project finance, architecture, and the like, and the ability to really um, be an active and capable lender that can manage through um, what is often a, a number of changes that would happen during the construction phase, but also the capital markets. DCM, the debt capital markets in the United States and in Canada as a whole, have been quite accommodating to P3. On the taxable side, the U.S. private placement market um, has accepted a number of, of private uh, of P3 um, financings. And to the extent that tax exempt financing is, um, is eligible under the tax codes in the United States, private activity bonds um, are um, a familiar usage for, for P3s with respect to greenfield projects. So I'm gonna pause here and um, wanna make myself available as much as anything for a, a, an interactive um, Q, Q and A as Charles and I had talked about um, since We've, uh, we, we have a number of, of areas that we can, um, we can engage in on, and um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop here. Thanks, Ray. That's great. And I, and I think we've, everybody's done a great job of uh, providing the amount of depth and broad context on this topic that we wanted to, to get out there. And there's a few questions that, that, that have popped up as we go. Uh, one of them, and I, I'm going to direct this uh, to Paul and then uh, Colby, and I'll kind of give you the, the context. Uh, Colby had mentioned uh, the perspective that the large convention activities uh, in person, uh, he was not looking to see until 2023. Um, and that uh, lines up um, very much with the status of the metropolitan uh, uh, public economies that we see. Most uh, cities are forecasting uh, contractions through uh, their fiscal years, which takes them into 2023 as well. Uh, the context of going into this is a, the uh, travel and leisure sector, particularly in the convention space, has been one where the public sector has played a, a role, uh, reinvesting a portion of their convention-driven activity taxes uh, into support um, civic centers, as Ray had mentioned, convention centers, uh, large uh, convention hotels, and so we have seen a role uh, that has made sense as areas try to expand uh, 
uh, now we're looking at a moment of contraction. So my, my first question, uh, Paul, and then to Colby is, um, where, what role do you see the public sector playing in this sector uh, in the short term through 2021, 2022, before, uh, before, before that expansion uh, reemerges? And I'll ask Paul to take that first. Yeah, thank you, Charles. You know, I mean, obviously, they, 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 have to, they have to play a role because ultimately they're, they're convention centers and, they're, and, they're, and their desire to bring um, people into their cities uh, to get that tax revenue um, is, is going to play a, an, an important factor. I don't think, I think people are still trying to work through what they can do with those facilities while they're not being used as, um, while they're not being used as convention centres as such. But uh, certainly a lot of these municipal um, municipalities need to, uh, to get engaged with the hospitality industry um, to, to ensure that they can continue to grow, um, grow, grow their cities accordingly. I guess I would follow up on that and you, you look at the, you know, we're looking at it again, uh, there, I'm going to slide back on a, a quick slide quickly. Uh, there was a question that went with that too about, you know, why we're focused on Texas uh, in general. And I would say if, if you look again at inbound outbound migration and California is an, uh, an interesting one that goes with this, um, you know, we've seen so many companies leaving California and going into the Texas and Southeast markets. Um, we think that you'll start to see funds become available and, you know, due to company movement, people movement, other property taxes, you know, people forget that real estate takes time. I mean, you know, a five-year project is quick if you go soup to nuts. And so for us, we see this as a prime time to look at redevelopment uh, and being able to go through a real estate cycle of building and or conversion. Uh, and trying to access P3 funds today, planning for the future. I would just also jump in and, and maybe suggest a couple of other thoughts around reuse of, of downtown hospitality assets. Um, affordable housing um, is, a, is a great one. We've seen that done in Canada, particularly in Western Canada, where um, historic properties have been converted into historical, into uh, affordable housing. Um, Certainly, the residential usages that we've been talking about would, would work. Um, but I'd also add university and colleges, um, which are um, in their own right, you know, going through a transformation um, in many ways and, and struggling in many ways. But util utilizing downtown assets where they can be closer um, to a, um, a population that is not necessarily um, going through college for the first time, but perhaps taking classes. Um, we've seen properties redevelop redeveloped into um, college and university assets where convention-related um, space is quite welcome um, for, uh, for teaching or for university conferences or college conferences. So I, I throw that out there as, a, as another example of where there could be collaboration between the public sector and the private sector on reuse of these assets. Thanks, Ray. And I think that... Um... You know, that tails into even the discussion that we had on our, uh, our last panel, uh, where the um, real model for that type of investment was Howard University. And, and you can see how uh, municipal priorities, higher ed priorities, and that leveraging of investment can produce results that, that really do, um, you know, build towards the future. Um, and, and when you're trying to build towards the future, uh, and this is a segue to a question for, for Stan, uh, it, you know, a lot of the assumptions you take with it uh, have historically been uh, the um, uh, demands of the, the most mobile of us, uh, the millennial class and things to that extent. Um, Stan, this is what I think we've said a couple times, but but certainly what uh, I think could fairly be assumed to be a behavioral changing economic event. And certainly when you look at what Colby and Paul had indicated uh, about the emergence not taking place until fully 2023 in this area, uh, that's long enough to change behaviors. Uh, so when you're in the design space um, and trying to identify what uh, components are important for a successful project uh, building for the future when it's so uncertain. Um, 
I, I was hoping you could take take us through a little bit of the thought process on how you, how that planning is approached and how uh, consensus can be derived at uh, design components and use components that are going to be most equipped to last beyond uh, beyond the upside here. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think uh, when, you, when you think of the large national uh, or international hospitality groups, uh, Hyatt, uh, Marriott, uh, those that that have properties all over the place, they, there was a, there's a lot of thought going on among the various brands they have. If you, if you imagine somebody like a Marriott or a Hyatt will have, you know, 15 or 20 different brands that are finely focused on particular uses, uh, groups or markets. And some of them for, you know, the younger crowd, some of them for the older crowds. And they're constantly rethinking those. And there's a lot of thought going on now about um, uh, making sure that they shift along with their, with the markets that they're tracking. W is a classic example. One of the slides we had there was uh, a W element that was a very large property um, that was made possible uh, through funding through the state of Pennsylvania uh, Convention Center Authority because it became a convention hotel with 800 keys. And now they have to reposition themselves to, to work as a uh, leisure market. Um, it's, it's, it's helpful that it's right in downtown and there's normally a very strong um, uh, leisure component to that so they, they can make a shift. But they they um, they will go through uh, and various developers who own existing properties or, or looking at putting new properties in, when they go through their pips, they they that by the time they get to that stage, they'll do some tweaking in their brand and tweaking in their offerings to make sure that they stay relevant with with what's going on in their locales. And of course, the ones that are in and around universities is different than ones that are out in the suburbs. But yeah, that that's a kind of every two or three years, that's that's something that those property uh, owners of, of hotel properties will go through. Thanks, Dan. And, and Ray, um, this is for you, just kind of on the infrastructure side. So, you know, when I uh, listen to uh, Colby's analysis of, uh, you know, market drivers, uh, you certainly can see um, the uh, components that make for uh, an appealing market. And, and that's, you know, partly gives you the, the Texas focus that he had mentioned. Uh, and then earlier there was an outline of, you know, what I would, I would say is kind of your top 50 metro areas and that, that second 25, uh, which was certainly challenged uh, before uh, COVID happened uh, is is going to be um, maybe a little bit slightly magnified risk uh, going in for the vertical development here. Um, in those areas, uh, you'll see uh, communities looking for an economic engine, and when the vertical development is not, they may rely on infrastructure as an initial jump start. Um, so, in in that context. What are you seeing as uh, the likely or anticipated um, infrastructure investment over the next 12, 24 months in what I'd say some of our, um, you know, mid top 50 metro areas? Do you have a perspective on that? Sure. I, the way I would characterize it is with respect to the P3 space right now, um, we're seeing some activity with respect to um, what I would call K through 12. Um, as a sector that has really come out in a, in a way that we've not really expected um, and hadn't seen in the past. Um, we're continuing to see um, downtown civic center development, um, as, it, as I had mentioned. Um, Long Beach and now Los Angeles, I think, are both two entities that are looking at um, or have already redeveloped their downtown um, city hall space and are looking at ways to um, Co collaborate, if you will, um, with commercial developers where there's, in effect, a bifurcated structure, as I mentioned, where it's um, partially governmental and partially um, commercial use. Um, so those are on the radar screen. There's also, um, in terms of what's happening right now, um, we didn't talk about um, transportation in a, in a direct sense, but um, train stations, to the extent that um, there is 
um, a train related assets. Transit oriented development is probably something that um, this audience is familiar with, but um, Amtrak, which is you know often much maligned, um, has actually undertaken a relatively systematic approach to some of its larger um, downtown um, train facilities where you have historic structures in many instances that have um, not been fully utilized and have become relatively attractive um, properties that um, are mixed use uh, with retail, office, um, hotel opportunities. There are a number of markets where we've seen this actually happen. Right now, we're working on Philadelphia 30th Street um, as, uh, as, a, as a live project right now. Um, but Amtrak has, I think, I think already um, completed uh, Chicago and um, Washington, D.C., I believe, is also undergoing another renovation. And of course, New York City is undergoing um, a massive renovation of its um, downtown train facility where um, you're bringing in um, a postal facility, um, the Farley Building, um, relocating the Amtrak station um, from under Madison Square Garden or One Penn Plaza, which is a, a, a rather um, unattractive and, and um, I would say inhospitable place for travelers coming into New York City. And um, that, that development is underway with um, a number of uh, large national real estate developers in conjunction with um, the, uh, the, Penn, the Penn Station Redevelopment Corporation, which I think is has, has been since renamed. So um, I, I would point those areas out. And we, there are other examples of transit-oriented development where you have downtown um, opportunities that are going on right now, some high-speed rail. You mentioned Texas. Um, there is a project that we're involved in that has gotten um, a reasonable amount of public press, but may not be necessarily very, very well known. Dallas to Houston, um, a high-speed rail is being developed and there's a significant amount of transit oriented development around um, both of those anchor um, stations along those in line uh, along that alignment so um, just a couple of examples here i hope that uh, addresses your question charles no it absolutely does and uh, for uh, a number of reasons we've got a high affection for uh, hearing about investment in Philadelphia uh, and then Texas as well, two of our, our P3 Group's favorite areas. So we, we appreciate that. And we certainly appreciate um, all of you participating in the panel today uh, as we do our best to try to carry this thoughtful discussion forward through um, uh, an uncertain time, but certainly one that uh, we're starting to see a, a shift out there, particularly on the COVID side. And we feel a little bit more uh, comfortable discussing uh, some economic impact forecasting out of this. And we're grateful for everyone who's attended today. Again, uh, to the extent you've had questions we have not had a chance to get to, we will work to uh, respond to those, um, make the uh, presentation available to you as well. And we certainly hope that you will take a moment to complete our survey uh, so we can continue uh, providing some thoughtful discussions. Uh, with that, I wanna say thank you to our panel. Thank you to everyone that attended and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.